So I gotta say, I got a really soft spot in my heart when it comes to this musical. This amazing musical based on the novel by Victor Hugo. You see, going to see the, the Broadway show as it traveled through San Antonio, this show, Les Mis, as the cool kids call it, was my very first real date. I bought the tickets with my own money that I had earned working my first real job. I picked up my date in, well, not my car, my parents' car, but, but I drove away to pick her up, and, and I paid for dinner and for the coffee and pie afterwards, all with my own money, no borrowing from my parents whatsoever. And so you see, there's always been this really soft spot in my heart for Les Mis because it, is, it's, it marks one of those pivotal, seminal moments in my life as I moved out of childhood and into young adulthood. And maybe it's because I'm turned, I just turned 40, but those kind of moments have been on my mind lately. <laughs> and my parents must have just been sick with worry as I drove their car out of their driveway <laughs> into downtown San Antonio at the dead of night with a girl in my car. And the fact that I ended up liking the play, that's, that was a bonus. Because I didn't even know what the play was about when I bought the tickets. I just knew that it won a couple of Tony Awards, it was tearing up the, the Broadway scene, that it was a giant and musical theater. The fact that I actually got something out of the play was a complete bonus 100%. And it seemed coincidental that the tone and the themes of the play touched on the tension between law and, and forgiveness, grace and punishment, justice and social inequality. What was important was that I was on the first real date. <laughs> so when John and Jeffrey and I decided to run with this Broadway series, Les Mis was essential to be one of the five that we looked at. For its message is as relevant as it was in 1862 when, when Hugo wrote the novel, as it was in 1985 when the Royal Shakespeare Company debuted it in the West End. Not that the play or the book, for that matter, was universally loved when it first came out. It was, both were panned in the newspapers. Uh, the New York Times called, at the debut of the Broadway run of the show, panned it as the shallow end of the pool of Christian values masquerading as an epic tale. The critics initially hated it. But as if in step with what the choir just performed, the people spoke up and rose up and carried the book to become a classic and the play to become one of the most successful and longest running and most rewarded runway uh, shows in the West End or on Broadway. Now, Hugo's book and the musical adaptation portrays the very real and broken world in which the Les Miserables, the, the downtrodden of the world, suffer greatly because of ignorance and poverty and degrading laws and social norms and customs and the injustices of the day. And it's not too hard to build a bridge from Hugo's world to our world in 2015. And yet, as the wonderful scholar and spiritualist John Morrison wrote in a book talking about the theological themes and ethical uh, implications of Les Miserables, he offers that the play suggests that there is a solution in the form of a redemptive journey of one man who discovers the nature and power of love and forgiveness. That but what matters is most is in spite, in spite of all of the hardships and injustices this one man experiences at the hands of another man and by society as a whole, instead of reverting to vengeance or greed, he surrenders to a power greater than these. He surrenders to grace, to forgiveness, and to unconditional love. And this comes to define him and direct his life. In other words, Les Miserables presents the hope found in a bit of good news that can't be found in aggression or pessimism or narcissism. It offers a different path. 
And it poses a question to all of us. If you were offered a different path, would you take it? If someone pointed out to you a third way, not the way of vengeance or greed or self-loathing or pity, but another path, a third way, a way of grace, would you take it? Would you turn from the path that you are down and start down that new path, no matter how hard it is to turn around? If you've seen the play, or read the book, or, or seen one of the cinematic adaptations, then you know that the backdrop of Les Mis is the French Revolution. And the following years, which are turbulent and violent, some of the most violent periods in the history of France. And in the preface of his novel, Hugo writes that this age has three serious problems. One is the degradation of man by poverty. The second is the ruin of woman by starvation. And the third is the dwarfing of children by physical and spiritual night. It was a time of unjust laws, social unrest, and great suffering by so many. And in the midst of this background of turmoil, human depravity, and violence of revolution, there is this woven, powerful tale of redemption of one man. The story centers on the life of Jean Valjean, who is a convict centered, sentenced unjustly for 19 years of hard labor and a lifetime of probation following for the crime of stealing a loaf of bread to feed his family. As the play begins, Valjean is released from prison on parole, and as he's about to leave the prison yards, he very meekly, because he doesn't know anymore, proclaims his identity, I am Jean Valjean only to have his tormentor throughout the entire show, the entire story, the inspector Javert, remind Valjean who he is in the eyes of the state of society, that he is nothing more than a number. And we who live in a post-Holocaust era know how dehumanizing it is to reduce someone to a number. Throughout the play, Javert diminishes and refuses to recognize Valjean's humanity. And instead, Javert, to Javert, Valjean is completely other. He is inhuman. He is simply the number. And he only refers to him as his prison number, 24601. A constant reminder to Valjean that in the eyes of many, if not most, in French society, he will always be a criminal, a felon, an outcast, shameless, and worthless. And as Valjean begins his journey away from the prison yard, Javar's words seem prophetic as no one will help him. He goes from place to place, an outcast, a pariah in society, and none will help him, none will provide for him, none will reach out to him, providing him food or shelter. And Valjean's heart, heart is bitter and desperate, and he comes to knock on the door of Monsignor Bonvenu, a humble priest who has risen the ranks of the clergy to become a bishop. Now, how many of you have studied French? A uh, handful. Then you would probably immediately catch, if you can decipher my butchered French there, that the bishops is more than a humble man of God, and yet at the same time, he is simply a humble man of God. For the bishop's name, Bonvenu, 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 means what? Welcome. Welcome. And he lives out the reality of his name by opening his door and offering the castaway criminal Valjean a meal of bread and wine, a meal that nourishes the body and the soul. And that illusion hopefully is not lost on you. And in the musical, the bishop sings to Valjean, there is wine here to revive you. There is bread here to make you strong. There is a bed to rest till morning. Rest from the pain and rest 
from the wrong. And after a series of events of not being able to, to accept this, this hospitality by Benvenu, Valjean revo- resorts to his baser self, and he, and he steals away from the abbey, running away with silver plates that he's stolen from the bishop, only to be caught by the authorities on suspicion of theft, brought back to the abbey so that the bishop may confront him and identify him as the thief, his parole being revoked, and him being sent back to prison for life. And the priest's reaction is none like Valjean has ever experienced. The priest, Benvenu, says to him in front of the police officer, Ah, there you are! Where have you been? I am so glad to see you. I gave you the candlesticks as well. Why didn't you take them? They could have brought you 200 francs. Why did you only take the plates? And in an instant, the police release Valjean and he's free to go, the priest absolving him of his crime. And then Benvenu walks over to the mantle and picks up the candlesticks and hands them to Valjean. And in the pivotal moment of the musical, the bishop sings to Valjean that he has some higher plan, a higher purpose, and that he must use this precious silver to become an honest man. By the witness of the martyrs, by the passion and blood, God has raised you out of the darkness, the bishop sings. I have bought your soul for God. And that's where we find Hugh Jackman playing Valjean in the clip that we saw from the 2012 cinematic version of the musical. I spared you any of Russell Crowe's Javar. (laughs) You are welcome. (laughs) And I know that this is a Broadway series and not a Hollywood series, but trust me, there is no better version of Valjean than Jackman. And this prayer of confession and absolution, the, the anguish and the existential crisis on his face is so plain to see. You can see the forgiveness and the grace that is offered Valjean is a chance as he sings, a chance for the new story to begin and it scares the living hell out of him. The existential crisis of identity was this first step of turning away down a path onto a new path, a journey that has a cycle of grace and redemption and forgiveness and love to it, the likes that Valjean could never have imagined, the likes that Jesus offers Simon Peter's mother, after he heals her and raises her up, and her response is to become a deacon, to serve others in response to the gift of Christ's grace. So the question is still before us. If you were offered a different path, would you take it? If you had been heading down the path of revenge or greed, self-loathing, or pity, and you were offered a path, a third way of grace and forgiveness, no matter how hard it may be, would you take it? Before I met Sasha, and well before we lived together, I was apt to allow a weary traveler and a transient soul to sleep in my house. I was alone. If something happened to me, it was no big deal. Plus, it seemed like the Christian minister thing to do. I've heard other Christian ministers do it. I thought I would emulate them. And one young man to sleep in my, spa, my spare bedroom was a young man named Tony. He was making his way from Chicago to Seattle, and he stopped by my church in Miles City to see if he could get some food and a place to stay and a little bit of money for the next leg of his bus trip. And you probably know where this is going that uh, I let him into my house, and as he left in the morning after sleeping, uh, and without me initially knowing, he stole really the only thing that I had of value, and he sold it uh, at the pawn shop for for money. He stole my laptop. But he didn't plan his getaway very well, because I met him at the bus stop. (laughs) And once I figured out, you know, I I met him there, and and after a few half-hearted attempts to to lie and to, to, you know... He finally confessed, and he says, so I guess you're going to call the cops, and you want your money back. And I stopped him, and I said, no, I'm not going to call the cops, and you probably need the money more than I do. Just don't buy anything harder than cigarettes with it, will you? 
And I could tell that receiving that gift of, of grace and forgiveness was a thousand times harder on Tony than the decision to steal my laptop in the first place. But I don't want you to think that I'm some saint. You see, when I was 12, 13, I stole my best friend's dad's credit card. And I used it to buy a video game. And not knowing really at 12 how credit cards work, I didn't know that there would be a statement coming in the mail at the end of the month <laughs> that would tell my best friend's dad what I bought, where I bought it, when I bought it. So it didn't, you know, he's a smart man. It didn't take him very long to figure out what had happened and who had done it. So one day I'm over at his house playing with his son and, I, and he takes me into the garage and he confronts me and after a few half-hearted attempts to lie my way through it, I confessed. And I was sure my life was over. So you're going to tell my parents, aren't you? And I knew, I knew I would be grounded not until I went to college because college was no longer on the books. That was no longer a chance. My dad was going to take me down to the recruiting office and make sure I got into the military and went off to boot camp. He said, no, I'm not going to tell your parents. And I said, well, I could sell the game and give you the money that I get and I can work off the rest. But he said, no, just keep it. You're having a good time playing it and my son likes playing it too. Plus, he said, and I will always remember this, he said to me, and I'll, it hits me already, it hits me in 2015 like it hit me in 87. He said, you're not a thief, but you did steal from me. But it's not what you've done, it's what, what you will do that will define you. Do you want to be a thief? I don't think you do. And receiving that grace from Mr. Bellamy was harder than any decision I made to steal his credit card and buy the game in the first place. But I could tell that as Mr. Bellamy shared that piece of wisdom with me, that he had been the recipient of a similar grace in his past. So the question is still before us. If you were offered a different path, not a path of revenge or greed, loathing or pity, but a path of grace that could come to define you and direct you, would you do it? I want you to do me a favor this week. I want you to find a quiet time. And I know for some of you that might be tough. But I want you to find a quiet, slow time to think about and pray about, meditate about, journal about, talk to someone else about. A time when you received the gift of grace from someone. And how that has inspired you to offer grace to others. And if and how this had an impact on you and upon them. How hard was it to receive? How hard was it to give? Because from the moment after we leave Valjean in the clip, his life is transformed. He's the recipient of God's hospitality. He is the recipient of God's grace. He becomes the mayor of a town, and he takes in a young girl to, to raise her after her mother dies. He helps the, the young men who have tried to, to fight the revolution and tries to save them from their own aggressions, and he even offers Javar an opportunity for grace when he had been captured by the revolutionaries, and Valjean has a chance to enact justice through an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but he offers his tormentor grace instead. So as we, simple and humble men and women of God try to emulate Benvenu and Valjean and Christ 
May we share those grace-filled moments this week. And may we risk sharing grace and forgiveness, love and redemption with one another in the future. No matter how hard it is, will you take a different path if it's offered to you? Well, Amen.